A hop stand involves adding hops to partially chilled wort after the boil and letting them steep for 20 minutes or so to enhance hop aromas. But what temperature is best for a hop stand? Well, convention states around 170 Fahrenheit or 77 C is about right. But I'm experimenting by brewing two identical IPAs, one with a 150 Fahrenheit or 66 C hop stand, and then the other at 200 Fahrenheit or 93 C. Will tasters be able to tell the difference between these beers? And for that matter, will I? Let's find out. This episode is sponsored by Clawhammer Supply. More on them in a bit. Okay, well, it's an experiment brew day, which is always quite exciting because I have two of everything. And also I'm gonna try a process that I haven't really done very much before. And uh, I'm really curious to see how well this works. So first of all, let's start with this batch here. I am gonna stagger these because doing everything at the same time would just be a nightmare. And I only have one extractor fan above me anyway. So let's start with this guy. And to this, I'm gonna add my water salts. So I have in here calcium chloride, gypsum, and Epsom salt. It's uh, pretty heavy on the gypsum. All right, and then in with the grains. My favorite hack now is just to mill directly into the grain basket and uh, watch those bubbles come up. Now the mold bill for this one, I have 10 pounds of foundation malt from Epiphany Craft Malt. That's my pale malt and is the base for this beer. I also have two pounds of Munich malt in here as well. And then 12 ounces of honey malt to finish it off. I think this should be a really nice base for a hoppy IPA. And I'll be mashing this for an hour at 152 Fahrenheit, 67 Celsius. Now the hop stand is the part that we care about in this brew day, but first I completed the mash in batch number one, and then it was on to the boil. Now we're at the boil stage, time to add some hops. Now normally what I would do is I would use a hop sleeve and then just put this in here, put the hops in. And that's because if I didn't do that and I just put the hops directly into here, well, that bazooka screen would have got gummed up, but I don't have a bazooka screen now, so I can just add this in. So I'm gonna add in my Cascade 60 minute edition. Let the hops be free. Okay, so with five minutes left in the boil, it's time to add in the next charge of hops, 90 grams of hops going in here. Again, they just run straight in. And finally we reach the variable. Now a hop stand refers to adding hops in wort held at a specific temperature. And during that hop stand, I'm gonna be forming a whirlpool. And that means I'll be keeping the wort in a constant swirling motion. That vortex will create a cone-shaped pile in the center of my boil kettle, which will be made up of the leftover hop material. And I want to keep those hops in my kettle as best I can, rather than bring them along into the fermenter. In a minute, it's gonna be time for the whirlpool and I need to get this down to 150 Fahrenheit or 66 Celsius. Uh, so I'm gonna do that by recirculating through a new little gadget I've got here, which is the counter flow chiller from Clawhammer. Now, if you were doing this for a plate chiller, eh, it's probably gonna be a bad idea because plate chillers have very thin lines and things can get clogged up. But with the counter flow chiller, I don't have to worry about that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this arm. This is the, the Whirlpool arm. I'm gonna hook it up. And then I'm gonna place it in here. Now a little tip that Emmett gave me is to just put this so it's tucked behind the thermal well. And then just to make sure nothing moves, I'm gonna use this clamp to put it in place. Now, even though I'm not quite ready to start chilling this yet for the Whirlpool just yet, I am now gonna recirculate through this so that I can sanitize the counter flow chiller. All right, so we're at the end of the boil. Now I am gonna turn on the water just to start chilling this. And we're gonna set the temperature here to 150 Fahrenheit. I'm just gonna maintain that. Right, well, that took really no time at all, just a, a couple of minutes. In fact, I kind of overshot. So this will warm back up to 150 Fahrenheit. Uh, just by cycling the heating element on and off. So now we've got the wort chilled to where we want it, it's really time to add now the Whirlpool addition. So let's sprinkle this in. 
and we're gonna leave this whirl pulling now for 20 minutes. That's the 20 minutes, got a nice whirlpool going here. So now it's time to get this wort out of here and into my fermenter. You can start to see now as we're draining here, the hot material is really all in the middle here. And of course, I still had a second beer to brew following all these same steps. Beer number two, pittering addition. Followed by a hop stand and a whirlpool at 200 Fahrenheit or 93C. Well, now I brought this down to 200 Fahrenheit, so I'm just running this through the, the can flow chiller but not actually running any water through it. So it took about three or four minutes to, to chill down, which is about as long as the 150 degree one took as well. So we're even there. So now it's time to add in these hops. I'm right at 200 Fahrenheit. So let's put, put them in for the whirlpool. And you can see I've got a nice whirlpool going again. So now these are gonna be a summarizing in this 20 minute period because we're still almost at boil here. This should be a more bitter beer than the other one. Now, what I mean by that is the isomerization of alpha acids from hops into iso alpha acids is most effective at temperatures above 185 Fahrenheit or 85 C. Below 80 Celsius, and isomerization basically becomes negligible. And it's iso alpha acids that contribute bitterness to beer. My hop stand at 150 Fahrenheit or 66 C will have resulted in virtually no further isomerization. But my second batch with a hop stand at 200 Fahrenheit or 93 C, well, that had an additional 20 minutes for isomerization of alpha acids to occur. Therefore, in theory, there should be more bitterness. And, and there's another difference between the batches that I was able to measure. My 150 Fahrenheit hop stand batch had an original gravity of 1054, but my 200 Fahrenheit hop stand batch had an original gravity of 1057. That's consistent with the extended time near boiling temperatures, which caused increased evaporation and therefore slightly more concentrated wort. Now, I doubted tasters could distinguish the two beers based on just the difference of three gravity points, but that isomerization difference did get me wondering. Now, both batches received a single patch of fresh imperial yeast that was in the form of A15 independence, and they were fermented at 68 Fahrenheit, 20 C. So could participants tell these beers apart? Well, before we get to that, just a quick word on today's sponsor, and that's Clawhammer Supply. Look, I've been brewing on the Clawhammer 10 gallon electric home brewing system for years. I put several hundred batches through this thing, including the two for this experiment, and it's never let me down. These systems are easy to use, they're consistent, and they're super versatile. Clawhammer Supply also offer brewing accessories, including the Counterflow Wurt Chiller and the Whirlpool Arm that I used for these brews, and a keg fermenter. And it almost goes without saying that Clawhammer Supply have one of the best channels on all of YouTube, I never miss an episode. Check out all they have to offer at clawhammersupply.com. So, the triangle test. Participants received two cups of the beer brewed with the 150 Fahrenheit hop stand and one cup of the beer brewed with the 200 Fahrenheit hop stand and was asked to identify the unique sample. Now, I collected a lot of data for this one, and first up, I sent some samples to my buddies, Kyle and Emmett from Clawhammer Supply. I'm Kyle with Clawhammer Supply. I'm Emmett with Clawhammer Supply. And we're triangle testing here. I'm gonna test very poorly. I don't know, man, of all the tests you've taken in your life, this might be the one that you have the highest chance of passing. That's pretty true. So we got, I guess, two are the same and we got an oddball out. Okay. And Martin said to pick the one that is different. So this is whirlpool okay. temperature. Whirlpool temperature. Well, this ought to be easy. You think? No. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We always whirlpool at one like 6170 because I feel like I read an article in a magazine a while back that yeah. said you're going to get the most fruity flavor out of that and less bitterness. But let's be honest, how much difference do you think it'll actually make? And his make? is 16200 at 150. So it's a pretty big swing. Mm. So the thing is, though, at the lower temperature is supposed to hold on to more of the aroma, right? You know, the yeah. higher temperature because hop oil and the aroma is like right? volatile. So yeah. it'll just fly off. So I think that's the idea, right? You're yep. supposed to get more of the flavor hanging out. Yeah. So really, I think it's more of a function of, it's a smell test, not a taste test, Ooh, right? Maybe. Hey, you know what they say is you should have like cacao nibs. Can you grab that? Yeah, we have those. We have I mean, I haven't like, you know, 
but drank, but I'm gonna smell them. I'm gonna smell the nibs. Oh yeah, that probably blew my <laughs> blew the whole yeah. the whole sense. I think I have an answer already without even tasting. You're that confident on your nose. I'm pretty good with my nose generally. I'll tell you what, it's a nice beer. Yeah, I would drink a couple of yeah. these. Okay, I'm locked in. Want to move the one you think is different forward? The count of three. Yeah. One, two, three. Oh no. Uh oh. Well, see, I was I was about to say these two are the same, and that was different. I feel like these two had a little bit more bitterness. I, I didn't but... even taste them. Should I taste them? <laughs> oh, you didn't taste them? <laughs> I'm gonna stick with my answer. I like it. Are you ready? Wow, you use glitter and everything. I know, dude. Check this out. You know, he stole this for his wife. <laughs> She's like, oh, where am I good? Where's my good stationery? <laughs> the odd colored beer out is red. Look Ooh. at you. Nice. Didn't have to taste it. This one had less aroma flavor, but this one has more of like a vegetal hop flavor. And this one has more of a hop flavor that I like. So I don't know what that means. Very nice, this, Martin. Yeah, this is overall really great. This is a solid beer. Love it. Damn, Carl. That's impressive. Getting the right answer from, well, basically aroma alone. Now, Libby also took the triangle test, and if you don't know Libby... Libby is the, the Clawhammer's superstar, iconic video editor. All I know is these two smell different. One, This one smells really hoppy, this one smells less hoppy. But these don't smell that similar either. Okay, I'll just drink and see. I'm just gonna say this one was the oddball. No, was it this one? That was my second guess, so it was those two. Dang it! So far, we're one for three. Now, I also took the test, generously giving myself every advantage by doing it five times. Just on aroma alone, it's red. Yep, it's red. Correct? I can tell from the start that's red again. That's just Torim. Yep, it's red. Round three. I smell one of them. It's green. Blue. Green. But here's the thing. Every test up until now, it's been semi blinded. Meaning participants went in knowing what the variable was and, well, potentially cluing them in to what to look for. But what about fully blinded participants? Folks who were told nothing about how the beer was brewed at all. Well, I collected data at the White Street Brewers Guild and, quite memorably, at a special beer tasting event at my corporate office at work. A total of 29 participants took the test in all. At least 15 participants would need to make the accurate selection to achieve statistical significance, and a total of 13 did. That's not enough to say that tasters could reliably distinguish the beers. So we've really got some mixed results here. Based on just aroma alone, Kyle and myself, we were confident in the difference. Or we were just lucky guesses. But blinded participants, they fared less well. To my mind, such a large difference in hop stand temperature did result in both measurable differences, like in the original gravity, for example, but also in differences to both the aroma and the taste of the finished beers as well. And I personally much preferred the aromatics of the hop stand held at the lower temperature. But for future brews, well, I'm, I'm probably going to go back to the middle ground of 170 Fahrenheit or 77C and hope to get the best of both worlds. But what about you? What is the optimal temperature range that you use for a hop stand? Or is it just not something you worry about too much? Let me know in the comments. Look, thanks to everybody who participated in this one, especially Kyle, Emmett, and Libby for filming their triangle test. And I'll see you on the next one.